Okay, good. So, today uh, we talk about ontologies and in particular uh, about the particular type of ontologies uh, that uh, are uh, supported by the OWL language, the ontology web language of the Semantic Web Initiative. So, if you search for the concept of, of ontologies, it's a very wide and general topic and in the past many let's say different uh, research groups uh, or groups of research groups uh, uh, developed their own uh, formalism for assessing ontologies mm -hmm. and uh, more or less OWA try to collect all of those uh, towards a unified view and unified representation mm -hmm. so this is the one that we should be working on if we are working on the semantic web even if uh, some groups are still working on some other formula. So um, what we say would be maybe 95% applicable to all different technology frameworks, uh, but some of, the, some of it will be specific to OWL. We will learn the language, of course, and, but mostly we try to reason about the concepts uh, and the structure of this uh, uh, new kind of representation. So the question is, uh, why do we bother about ontologies? Uh, we have a, uh, uh, you already saw this picture in the, on the first uh, day, uh, where we discovered that there are many different ways uh, of representing information, of representing metadata, and uh, uh, these different ways have, of course, different characteristics. Uh, they may be more complex uh, to, to represent, but at the same time could uh, deliver more information contain more information mm -hmm. just to uh, maybe get a little more detailed uh, we can group very broadly mm -hmm. the representation formats the knowledge representation formats into these three groups uh, the first one term is uh, is uh, where you just give a list of items okay so uh, vocabularies, dictionaries, uh, uh, glossaries, and so on. You have a list of names, of tags, of labels, uh, of items, whatever. And uh, <coughs> the information provided is the, uh, this set of lists uh, to your applications. There is no meaning associated with any element of the list. There is no relationship between the different elements of the list. Maybe we can say, not, 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 not in all the cases, but different terms could be considered distinct, separate, different. But it's not always the case. In a vocabulary, probably, you may have uh, different terms, synonyms, that represent the same concept, same idea. So not even the uniqueness uh, constraint is conserved uh, by this first uh, level of knowledge representation. It's a very simple level. It's already something because it, it uh, enforces you to use one of the words or the classes or the categories that are defined instead of just being having uh, any possible label, any possible text, textual representation. At the second level, we have uh, categorization, classifications, uh, taxonomies. These are all different varieties of the same uh, family of representation systems where the focus is not only on the list of names, names but also on the relationship between these names. And in taxonomies and this second group uh, of classifications, the main relationship between terms is uh, general to particular. So bigger to small. Uh, small is contained into big, uh, small is a particular case of the big, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have usually trees of concepts, not just sets, uh, but trees of concepts, of terms, of labels, mm -hmm. you can call them in different ways depending on the context in which you are working, or in more generally forests of trees, so mm -hmm. several different trees rooted at different starting points. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is very, let's say, frequent uh, to have uh, some uh, representation like that. We have a relationship between concepts, but the relationship is only of one type. 
the specialization, the subclassing. RDF and RDF schema, or at least RDF schema, defines, allows us to define a representation of this. With a subclass of a, a construct in RDF schema, we can already create taxonomies, hierarchy of trees. The issue is that that is the only relationship that is already defined, subclass. There are no other relationships available. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens when we allow the definition of other relationships, not just subclass? So we move to the third, to the more powerful, let's um, say, uh, domain, uh, where actually we have uh, networks, not just trees, networks of concepts. Uh, and the relationship between network, these networks are different. There are different types of relationships. We have, may have some cases in which such uh, relationships are predefined, uh, like in Thesaurus. Uh, thesaurus, you know, is a, a dictionary in which every term is defined, so it's a glossary. It has a terms, it has definitions for the terms. It has, uh, uh, for every term, probably the, defini or, uh, the relationship with the most more general terms and the more specific terms. Mm -hmm. That's how it's a book. You, can, you, you have a concept and you have the list of more general, more specific terms. So this would put that into the uh, let's say a crossing between a taxonomy and the glossary. But in addition, in a thesaurus you have you also have other types of relationships. Uh, the um, opposite of synonym of related to See also huh, are all type of relationships that you find in SS hours. Hmm? And uh, these are different relationships. And the see also doesn't mean that it's a synonym, that it's the same word. Hmm? It means that in some way it's related. So yeah, these are different relationships that have different meaning, different semantics. And this may not uh, sound. For example, there is a standard in W3C, it's called. No, I, I thought of putting this line at the end, I didn't. Um, there is one standard, which, which is a SCOS standard, SKOS, uh, Simple Knowledge Organization System, which is an uh, extension of our gear schema just for defining the sound. That gives you the relationship, predefines the relationship that you would use. If you want to build a, a, a knowledge organization system like this, hmm. so we are adding semantics, so we are adding types of relationships, behaviors of relationships, and uh, um, but these relationships are still predefined. When we go to the most powerful levels, we are we are adding the capability for the designer of the ontology to add new user-defined relationships. Okay, we could also do that in RDF schema, but that was just uh, you know, picking an, a verb from a vocabulary without any real way of giving meaning to that relationship. For example, in a thesaurus, the uh, most general term relationship is, by definition, a transitive relationship. A is more general than B, and B is more general than C, then it follows that A is also more general than C. This property, this characteristic of this other generated uh, relationship, is in the definition of the SCOS standard. It's already defined like that. In RDF schema, we have no means of saying that a relationship is transitive. So we are just adding names, in the schema we are at this level, names, trees of names, nothing more. If we want to have more uh, expressive power, we, we, sh we should have more, a more pow powerful uh, language. So we are trying to extend the modeling idea of RDF into something much more complex. Uh, there's one thing that uh, we should still keep in mind uh, from RDF, you already know, 
that we have a system we, we can think about a, a model at two levels the concepts and the instances okay rdf uh, as a language and we will see also OWL as a language don't make any formal distinction between classes and individuals between classes and instances between concepts and data hmm? they are all URIs they are all resources in RDF it's our point of view as a modeler that we say okay these are classes sets containers concepts and these are the elements that will be contained into those and the boundary between the class and the instance level is the type way type is the instantiation action so if i have a concept that i think is a class I model it for being a class, for being a set, for being a concept. Then the type, the typed objects, are instances of this class. Hmm? You know, WL gets a bit more complex, but we still have to maintain this uh, uh, separation. Don't confuse the instances, which are resources, which are URIs, with the literals. Okay, the literals are just a string value, the name is a string. Huh? The instance of a class, the class is a, is a resource, the instance of a resource is another resource. Then we may have some literals attached to that, huh? but the literals are not the instance. Um, okay, this is another example of, a, of another RDF schema, RDF document with, with the RDF schema. But uh, again, we, here we have some more information, some um, um, property which is defined with this domain, its range, and so on. But the idea is always the same. Uh, the fact that is this picture, in this picture there are practically all the RDF schema constructs. Mm -hmm. So uh, subclass, domain, sub property, uh, and so on are all the. <laughs> it, it, we are using the full language of RDF schema. Hmm? Okay. Uh, but in many cases, uh, RDF schema is too weak. I, I won't mm, go into the details of the different points, but you find that if you are trying to use RDF schema to model some real uh, information, uh, you are finding a lot of problems. Hmm? Uh, for example, the second one is quite easy, cardinality restrictions. We are used to say, okay, this relationship may bound one instance with the, how many instances of the other side. No? When we are modeling a database, for example, this is the first question we ask. No? What, what kind of relationship we have? Uh, course is taught by staff member. How can we say that the course is taught by exactly one teacher? We can, okay? In RDF schema, we can. If we want to represent that, RDF schema is not enough. Um, the, the other example that they made is, uh, the, for example, the positivity of a relationship. RDF schema doesn't give you any way of saying that if you are enrolled in a course and the course is part of the university, then you are enrolled in the university. Uh, so we want to extend RDF and RDF schema with a more powerful language. Uh, and uh, well, for us, we just need to learn the result. But uh, for the designers of this language, uh, it was quite difficult to walk on a very fine line. Uh, and trying to balance the expressiveness and the computability of the representation. So we want to add new constructs in order to enable designers to, to describe more complex uh, information. Hmm? But if we make it too, too complex, it would become uh, 
uh, impossible algorithmically to, to reason and to deduce information about that. So we want something that is at the same time, at the same time expressive but can be reasoned automatically with the acceptable runtimes of the algorithms. So not uh, centuries, but uh, something that can be useful in, in, a, in a practical sense. So uh, the, say, the mathematicians have to find a good balance between these two requirements. Um, so actually, what the end result? What's, what's an ontology? What are you what does it contain? What are the ingredients that you put into an ontology? Well, we already named most of these classes, instances, okay, nothing new with respect to RDF. Properties, the same as in RDF, but more powerful. And the property would be of different types depending on the fact whether the property links a concept with a resource with another resource or a resource with a literal we will call them object property or better properties we got into much more detail than you would like today um, and then well annotations are quite easy so the way of attaching textual information descriptions to resources but what makes uh, what brings more, uh, say, semantics usually are the restrictions. So the fact that you can limit the way in which a class can contain instances. We can limit the way in which a property can link different objects. In RDF, everything is possible. We say that this is a course and is taught by this who is a teacher. But there's nothing that prevents me from using the is taught by relationship between other writers, which are not courses, are not teachers. Hmm? Uh, these relationships are open. We can always add the, uh, properties to them. Uh, a way of uh, uh, it's not possible in RDF to say that or to forbid that discrete mathematics uh, is a professor. I could add a trifle discrete mathematics of type professor, which is actually should be a course. But if I add this trifle, nothing breaks down. Of course, the conceptualization doesn't mean anything because I'm not representing any real information. But from the from the mod model point of view, I can forbid it. Hmm? So it's there's too much freedom. And if there's too much freedom, I at, at the end of the day I will not be able to understand what this is about. Because it can, it could be anything. So I'm not providing real knowledge about what this represents. Hmm? So on the other hand, uh, in OWL, giving meaning, giving semantics means restricting the ways in which you can combine. Hmm? Uh, forcing you to avoid or to forbid some possible links between objects. Hmm? So these are the main uh, uh, concepts that are shared uh, among uh, many different languages for ontologies. Okay, we will focus on OWL, of course, but these concepts are the same in many other different uh, uh, ontology formats. Uh, they will use probably different, slightly different terminologies. They call them classes instead of concepts, instead of containers, but. You know, the, the, the idea is very similar. Uh, so we focus on uh, the old language, OW language, ontology web language is the, is the full name. Actually, it's a strange acronym because uh, the full name is web ontology language, but it's, it, it's not that wall instead of old. 
they, they choose to make an, an, an anagram of the acronym because it's easier to pronounce. But uh, um, anyway, uh, OVL is uh, an extension of RDS schema, of course, that is compatible with uh, the mathematical formulation of description logic. It's compatible is too strong a word. It's, it's much inspired by description logic. Description logic is, uh, let's say, something that's very quite uh, similar to set theory plus uh, uh, first order logic, so logical predicates, Boolean logic, I would say. Uh, we won't get into too many mathematical details, but in some points uh, we need to, to remind them. Um, okay, so it adds. Uh, more expressivity, so more ways uh, of describing the legal values or the acceptable possibilities for classes and for properties. And since we have a more powerful uh, representation, we can do more. What can we do? Uh, this will be the subject of next week's uh, class about the reading. For today, uh, we try to understand the constructs of the language, mm -hmm. and uh, next week uh, we try to ac actually extract information. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, what can we do? We, can, we, we will be able to do consistency checking. So, is a given model consistent that contains some contradiction? Do I say in a place that uh, a course cannot be a teacher, and if I can say that the course and the teacher are distinct classes, then if that course would, by mistake, uh, uh, classified as a teacher, then the ontology will detect it, will be able to detect whether there are inconsistencies in the, in the model, in the class definitions, and in the way instances are associated to the classes. So, uh, we, say, we declare some rules and the ontology itself, of the reason of the ontology, will be able to check whether all these rules are, um, are satisfied. Uh, satisfiability checks means, uh, in the second type of reasoning we can ask to an ontology, is actually asking ourselves, uh, I define this class. Is this class the empty class? What kind of question is that? Say, if I put together a set of properties, a set of constraints, a set of requirements, the conjunction of all these requirements is compatible with the existence of some instances, I am asking for something that is impossible, or I am asking for something that may have instances, may have solutions. And the next step would be, can we find any of these solutions there? So, of course, if we have one class with a one instance, we already know that that class is not empty. But if I'm trying to define a class of all the teachers who have taught at least one course in the last two years, uh, but at the same time uh, are not uh, abroad or whatever, a complex property, which is made by combining properties over existing elements, I'm not sure whether this set of properties is logically consistent, can be made true, like in an equation. You write an equation, you don't know whether the x can be solved. Hmm? And it's the same here. And the third is uh, classification. I give you an instance and tell me what class it belongs. And which is on the other uh, way you can say this is a class uh, what are the instances that can belong to this class mm -hmm. you can search starting from the class search starting from the instances so by applying the rules uh, in some way somebody who knows the rules can understand that in this room there are six persons and five are students. Okay? 
by understanding the rules of the courses of the university and so on, uh, and by knowing something about each person, it can put each of us in the right class, students of teacher or whatever. Hmm? So this is something that is, will be the, the final goal. It's already a lot, because it will not be easy to, to reach, to be able to answer these questions. At the same time, it's very little. Uh, when you start to look at semantics, you say, okay, I can I do a lot of effort for modeling the semantics and then we'll be able to do reasoning. And you expect that the reasoning is a very powerful machine in which you can ask any question and the system will give you a result. Actually, the kind of question that you ask is quite simple. So, one difficulty would be creating the knowledge model, creating the ontology. But the other is also asking the questions. Uh, because, for example, what you want to ask can be phrased in the form of a satisfiability check. But you need to, to turn the, the question in that way. But those, these are only, I don't want to anticipate much, uh, the question that you can ask natively to a original, to a semantic reason. We will learn how to navigate and crawl the knowledge base in order to get uh, more information on ourselves and can ask uh, custom questions to the, to the knowledge model. Mm. So this is what we are aiming to. But first, we need to learn the basics. And uh, um, sorry, this uh, is a bit redundant. Because we will take the steps, we will go to those. I don't want to tell them why. I, I left that reason because maybe somebody wants to read the slide, but uh, we will get to those uh, into uh, uh, by steps. Mm -hmm. um, so we already know that the ontology will contain classes and interesting properties. We already say that. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go to detail. But before going to detailed definition of this particular classes and instances, there are two big assumptions that need to be discussed here. These assumptions are one of the specific points of OWL, specifically of the semantic web, which are different from other uh, modern frameworks, and in some way they impact uh, the way uh, in which we can use ontology and the kind of question that we may ask. One is a stronger version of the open world assumption that we already mentioned at the RDF level. Uh, in OWL, in all the semantic web, uh, we still have this uh, uh, open world assumption and that can be summarized by this sentence. The truth of a statement is independent of whether it's known or not. What does it mean? It means that something may be true but I don't know it. I don't have the knowledge right now, here in my control, in my system, I don't have the knowledge to prove that this is true. But it's true. It means that if I can prove something, if I don't have in my system the evidence that something is true, it doesn't mean that it's false. It's simply unknown. A very easy comparison. If you have a database of names, you search the name, the name is there or not. So the question is this person in the system? The answer would be yes, no, true or false. Okay? Because we assume that the list of names that we have is complete, describes the system, contains all the information of the system. But just imagine that you have a very long table and your query will only read a part of it. Because there, are, there is another part of the table that is, a, is not accessible to you now for performance reasons or for whatever. So if you do the same query, is this 
person in the list? The answer might be yes, it's in the list, true. Or I didn't find. I can't say it's not in the list. Because I didn't check the full list. I couldn't check the full list. So I can only say I found it or I didn't find it. It's in the list or I don't know whether it's in the list. I can never say it's not in the list. Because the list will never be complete. This is the open water sign. There could always be some information that I don't know about that would make true something that I don't know yet. So, in other words, it would be nearly impossible to prove that something is false. Except in particular cases when we make a close list of that. Of um, so it it's always possible to add new information. Of course, the wrong the risk that if we add some information, then the whole ontology will become inconsistent. But uh, uh, means that the whole system cannot be reasoned because there's internal inconsistencies. But it's never possible that you add information and something that was true becomes false. It's always possible that something that was unknown becomes true. And so, since it's always possible, it's very hard to say the word false. There's no false, there's no not, actually, except in a special case uh, in the ontology language. The second uh, uh, assumption uh, is the no unique names assumption. It means that since uh, uh, the semantic web is a distributed uh, information system, you cannot assume that different people will use the same URI for referring to the same information. Um, as much as possible, we hope that people use, uh, use shared categories uh, and schemas, uh, and so the different uh, Concepts will share the same property names, the same class names, and all. But you can you can't enforce that. Hmm? So uh, different ontologies or different vocabularies may use different terms that actually refer to the same concept or to the same object. Hmm? Um, so this is possible, it's not a bad thing. What it means, the consequence of this, is that if you find two URIs that are different, two resource identifiers that are different, you cannot say that they refer to different elements. Um, even if I have uh, one person, you know, um, Let's take again the RDF schema that we had before here. David Binton is a resource, is an, as a professor. We may also have another here, Fulvio, is a professor. Okay? So you read that there are two instances of type professor. It's not true. Because nothing says that the two instances of the two resources refer to different uh, real people. The real person who could be the same is just represented by two different IRIs. Uh, this is quite strange at first. You cannot count items by counting resources because some resources could could be collapsed into one. So it's always difficult to say these two things are different just because they have different names. No. If they are different names, they may be different or not. If they are the same name, of course, we assume that they are the same resource. But if they are different names, uh, we don't know. Unless, uh, this definition says, unless we say, we state that explicitly. Unless explicitly stated otherwise. So we know we have some external knowledge 
to say that this IOI actually refers to this one type. So we can say that. But unless we say that, there's always the possibility hmm, of, of clashing. This happens at the class level and also at the, the, the individual level. Hmm. Okay. So, coming to the concept of the ontology. The ontology, the ecosystem in which ontology lives, uh, we already know that uh, uh, the ontology is based on RDF. So actually, all the construct of the ontology, of the semantic construct that we are defining, will be mapped into RDF state or that. So we'll discuss the different possibilities at the conceptual level, and at the same time, we'll see how to describe them in RDF. In some cases, the RDF description will be quite strange. It involves uh, having uh, uh, blank nodes, anonymous classes, and so on, just because RDF is a very poor language. So you need to, to create a little subgraphs to express it in simple properties. Mm -hmm. But it's just an exception. Uh, so we have some logical properties that we want to declare and we want to represent them in RDF. From the syntax point of view, there are different uh, possible serializations of OWL. So since uh, OWL is uh, so, uh, mapped to an RDF graph, of course we can export that into RDF XML. Of course, we can export that into Turtle. But there are also other formats uh, that are more specific uh, for ontologies. No? These other ones, Functional, Manchester, and OWL XML, which is not RDF XML. There are simpler formats, one, two, three. There are simpler formats which are not just uh, representation of the RDF, but they, they already interpret in some way the RDF uh, to give simpler representations for uh, ontology concepts. But all of them are equivalent. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of taste, a matter of knowledge of the languages. All of them can represent the same language, OWL. And on the bottom of the picture we see that uh, uh, the semantics layer would describe uh, the mathematical foundations, the, mat the real uh, mathematical meaning of every statement we have in the ontology. Uh, we are, it will build on top of the RDF semantics. So when we say RDF type means something, when we say RDF subclass is defined here at the RDF based semantics level. And uh, for all the other constructs of OWL that are not in RDF, there will be additional mm, for Formalizations. This formalization could be different depending on the profile of the ontology. This is something again that we will discuss uh, next week. Because the ontology can have different expressive powers depending on the type of statement that we use. And uh, for the simpler expressive powers, we might use uh, simpler mathematical models. A simple mathematical model could mean faster reasoning engine. So, but this is something about reasoning about the semantics. So, we now dive into this ontology structure to understand what we can put into the ontology. And he, I, I realized that uh, the combination of OWL and Monday morning uh, could be bad. Uh, but uh, if you fall asleep, uh, actually, we will follow this structure, which is the chapter four of that book up there in the corner. So. Um, I, I try to follow the, the same order so it's easier to, to have a, a, a reference to the book. So, uh, we see how to create the main building blocks uh, and other less important building blocks in this ontology. Uh, I will maybe skip faster or just skip to some of the concepts which are not so frequently used uh, to try to, hmm, let's say, have more time to discuss uh, uh, not just the syntax but uh, the usage uh, of the other concepts. Today we'll have uh, a bottom-up approach, the boring one. 
okay? One by one, different conference to learn the language. On Friday, that we will come and uh, do a top-down approach. So, how, given all this knowledge, how we can put together a new ontology from scratch from a uh, specific problem that we want to solve. So we try to both approach it, and at the end of the week, you should be able uh, to, to master this uh, ontology concept. Okay. Um, classes and the individuals, we have a definition. Classes are a resource that represents a set of individuals. And an individual is one item that could be part of a class. Hmm? Could be an instance of the class. A set, an element of the set. A class is a set, an individual is one element of that set. The strange part is that both classes and resources are, in, um, so both classes and individuals are resources in the RDF sense. So in the ontology, you will not have, in the ontology language, you will not have a clear distinction between those. You must have the distinction in mind. And you must decide when something stops being a class and starts being an individual. Stops being abstract and starts and start being concrete. And this depends on the modeling approach, or the modeling level that you want to make. Hmm? I, I know that it sounds fuzzy, but uh, we need some examples to clarify that. Hmm? Um, by looking at a given resource, just as the resource, we cannot say whether it's a class or individual. It's just a resource. We can understand it's, if it's a class, if it's more than a class or, in, or an individual by looking at the relationship in which the element participates. For example, Ryan, Andrew, person, class. Class is a predefined class in OWL and is the type of all classes. If we say that something, some resource is a class, it means that we are modeling this person as a class. Raya is a person. Person was a class, so this is an instance of a class, and we consider that as an individual. We only have these three levels in OWF. The meta concept of a class, a class is part of the meta model. A class is a set of all the possible classes that you could define in your life. It's not part of our model, it's part of the language. It's part of the meta model. Person, like many other classes, are classes. So we can create a class by creating an instance of the meta class of the metamodel level resource class. So, it's a bit strange at first because the, the construct that we use to create a class is the same that we use to create an instance. The is a, is a is RDF type, okay, relationship. So we declare a class with type class. We declare an instance, an individual, we type something that in turn is a class. Hmm? That's why I say that we cannot understand whether it's an individual or a class just by looking at the element, but only by looking at the relationships. In order to add, we try to limit ourselves to these three levels. Class is unique, there's only one. The class level contains all the classes that we want to model, and all of them are of type class, all of them. 
and the instance level contains all the elements that uh, are of type of some specific class. We don't want, and this is one of the partial restrictions of the all of the L, it's not totally forbidden, but in most of the profiles it is. We don't want to have easy relationships between individuals, nor is a relationship within classes. Okay? So in every we start from, from individual, we only always walk two levels of typing. And the second level we always end with the class. This is a restriction that we make. It's one of the say, constraints for the scalability of the language. You may know some logical paradoxes. No? Uh, I don't know whether, if I put it correctly, if in a city there's uh, everybody shaves themselves uh, except the dogs uh, who are shaved by the barber, and uh, the question was uh, will the barber shave himself or not? So there are some, uh, some constructs that we can do in our language or in the logical language that leads to contradiction, however you put them. So they make, uh, they show that our logical system, our speaking system is inconsistent. Because we can construct perfectly valid sentences that have no meaning. Means, means that they can be true nor false. We want to avoid this, of course, in, the, in our modeling. And uh, uh, actually, to avoid that, we should avoid talking, saying that a class is uh, another class. Somebody yeah, uh, tried treating classes as individuals, and individuals as classes create this kind of confusion. So we are sort of typing that. Actually, the OWL language doesn't prevent it, doesn't forbid it. There is one, the, the, uh, the full language of WL, it's called the OWL full profile, would allow you to, uh, to describe these kind of things. But at that point, uh, we should be aware that we are only at using the ontology uh, as a description tool, just qualitatively because we will not be able to reason anything about that if we are trying, if we are using all those kind of statements. So, but we don't want to enter into the philosophy of ontologies. To be pragmatic, we always see these two levels. In the description logic, uh, uh, say, domain, they call them the T-box and the A-box. T stands for terminology and A stands for assertion. In a T-box, so the class level, the conceptual level, we define the terminology, we define the classes, we define the vocabulary, we define the verbs, we define the nouns that we use for describing our world. And this is generic. The concept of a person doesn't depend on the specific persons that are there, it can be reused somewhere else, because it is a general concept. And now they are related. Hmm? A, person, a person can be maybe child or father of another person. This is general. Hmm? It's conceptual. It's an information that describes how things go, hmm? how the world is structured. We're trying to describe the world, how the world behaves, by defining concepts and properties. At the end, we have the assertion. The facts, the actual specific facts that go and populate the generic concepts. So, like if you do a very, say, uh, broad uh, parallel, like when you're creating a database, you have the schema that is fixed, 
and the instances, the data, which can change at every time, but they always need uh, to conform to the schema requirements and constraints. So this is the same here. We have the conceptualization and the actual data. OWL is a bit more flexible than description logic, but I like to think it this way, I think it's more order. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how do I create an individual? I assert, and asserting something is mathematically stating an action. If I'm saying that uh, Ryan is of type person, I'm adding to the logical system of the logic one new action. I, it doesn't need to be proven. Take my word for it. It's true. End of the story. This was an action. Something that doesn't need to be demonstrated, proven. You know that all the geometry that we know only stems from five actions. You, Euclid defined the five actions from which we derive all the geometry in mathematics that we know. So, in some cases, we, we learn from the mathematicians that uh, axioms are something that should be used very sparingly. Some creatures. You can't just assume that something is true. No. If something can be demonstrated starting from other actions, okay, then it's not an action, it's a concept. Uh, mathematically, these are all actions, but we are more, let's say, uh, free to create as many actions especially at the A level. There is no other way of saying that this is a person, if this is a physical person, they're just stating that. It's true. Okay, so we will have some actions that are part of the language at these levels. We usually don't create any actions at this level. And we populate that the knowledge base by listing a lot of actions at the A level. Huh? So we don't, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be ashamed of that, and we should be worried with that. We are not adding actions at the conceptual level, and so we are not breaking the reasoning of the ontology. We are just adding low-level facts. Hmm? Uh, so this is uh, the simplest way of uh, populating a class, taking an individual and saying you are that. You belong to that class. The other way is uh, indirect. Say, so, okay, I don't know exactly who are the person in this class, but I know some way of deciding whether a given person would be or not in the class. So I'm giving you a procedure, a logical, say, check to do, to perform, to check whether a person or individual actually belongs to the class or not. So I'm defining the class implicitly. I'm defining the class of all these PhD students who have less than 26 years. I'm not providing you doing it. The class is defined perfectly, there's no ambiguity, but I'm not telling you axiomatically, so by, for by forcing you some knowledge, uh, who are these students? I am giving you the rule that you can use to check and to find first to check whether a given individual belongs to the classroom. He should be a PhD student and should have less than 26 years. So it should belong to two different sets. And having less than 26 years means that it will have an age property attached and the value should be less than. So you have a, some check to do. But if you find a person, you can check it and say, say okay, you are in this class or not. On the other way, you can take the definition and search for all the instances to create the actual set of uh, uh, individuals that are currently known to be in the class. And not saying that are the class, that are currently known to be in the class, because there may be others that it, I don't know. The open word assumption. Of course, this is more powerful because I can describe, can create classes 
by defining rules and without knowing or before knowing the individual person and this rule will be valid every year and the content of this class will change as the information changes hmm? so we can actually discover new facts instead of knowing the facts before and forcing the fact into the ontology with an action we model the property and we ask the ontology for the fact for knowledge we ask the ontology give me this knowledge give me which are the people who belong to this class huh? all the conceptual level doesn't depend on the way we populate the class so all the language when you whenever we, de we define a class all the properties in the, the, the we define the class and the description and so on, and so on are valid in both cases so actually we are modeling the relationships without or before knowing the instances or without needing to know the instances okay so much for classes and, and the individuals at the first level properties are an extension of the RDI properties are something that link different uh, resources and we have two different uh, types of properties we call them object properties that link an individual to an individual or that type properties that link an individual to an individual okay, so we make them distinct because they have different properties they are, sorry, properties have different properties of course uh, they, they behave differently um, I want to remark this word here, individuals. Properties are, str are strengthening, uh, in OWL, that are defined at the class level, but apply, applied at the individual level. So when you define a property within two classes, a teacher teaches a course, actually this relationship doesn't say something about the class teacher or the class course. It says something about the instances of the class teacher, how they relate, how they can relate with the instances of the class course. Hmm? Um, like in object oriented programming, you define a property at the class level and then the property will be actually hmm, instantiated, that will really active only when you have an instance of the class so this property link individuals according to a rule that's, that's defined at the class level uh, for example these are individuals Ryan and Andrew were individuals so we don't have classes in this diagram and this property, Ryan knows Enzio, is a property that links, it's an object property because it links two individuals. This other name is a data type property because it links a literal to an individual. This is the real behavior of uh, properties, they link individuals. If we have many individuals, or we have, uh, we don't know the individuals, the individuals yet, we we want to be able to describe the property anyway, even before knowing the individuals. So we define the general rules of the properties by trying to relate the property to the classes that the individuals will belong to. So we will write in a way that knows is a property that can connect uh, persons to persons. So we will write like this. Person knows person. It doesn't mean that a person knows himself. 
this is uh, some confusion we usually make. Where uh, no, no int, for example, is, is a relationship whose domain and range are always personal. So if we declare the nose person property, saying that a person, the subject of this property should be a person, and the object of this property should be a person, I'm writing person knows person. What I'm meaning is that some person knows some possibly other person. Not that a person knows itself. So at the class level, there's no identity. We are sets. So a relationship here is a possible mapping of the sets. At the instance level, it's a one actual mapping between elements of the set. Hmm? So it's the way we interpret this re the relationship is the same. The way we read it, uh, the way we its semantics uh, is expressed is different uh, at these two levels. Okay. Uh, so before seeing some construct and examples, just a, a flash about the, the synthesis. There are, in, in, in most of the, of the slides, the same statement is written using all the possible languages. Functional style, RDF XML style, turtle syntax, and so on. I, we, we will always prefer the turtle one because it's more compact and easier, easier to read. We already are familiar with that. And uh, uh, other syntaxes that are specifically designed for uh, all of that. We don't need to learn them, we don't need to, to read them. Of course, the only important thing is that they are equivalent, so we can say anything in any, in any of these syntaxes. So, let's start the bottom-up, um, let's say, uh, analysis of the, all these uh, contents. Ontologies are documents. RDF document, XML RDF document, um, that contains some general information. And they always start, uh, they should always start with the header. And the header describes some namespaces, gives some textual description about the ontology, and may possibly import, uh, there's an email, OWL imports, uh, import other uh, ontologies so when i define an ontology i it's not isolated by the rest of the world it's something that may refer to other like the prefix no? we define in rdf this is actually more powerful because importing also means uh, reading the whole ontology and incorporating the concepts defining that ontology into this one a uh, prefix is just giving a name, a shorthand name, to a URI, and uh, importing actually means uh, uh, reading and uh, digesting the content. Um, another simple thing that we can add, we just uh, uh, said the simple things before, are annotations. In, in ontology, annotation is something that uh, has no semantic meaning. Sometimes we want to have uh, Let's give again this example, person. Person is a class name. Uh, but if I have a, a tool, a user interface, that should show something about these persons, what word should they use? Maybe there's one word for person in English, another for Italian. So that we want to have, we want to store some textual information some help, some comments, uh, some notes about the different classes. So instead of writing them separately, OWA has the possibility of incorporating notes, comments, uh, annotations, they call it, uh, in directly inside the ontology. So it's, it's everything in one place. Mm -hmm. So these annotations are actually of these two types, mainly. Labels or comments. Label is a shorthand textual word that can be used, it should be un usually understood by the users. Maybe the name is a shorthand name, it's uh, 
is a number or and the label should be human readable and the comments should be something longer that you in which you describe you define like in a glossary you define what the subject is about the other the others are less frequently used okay these are the two say general items for creating the ontology um, starting from the class and so on i want to create some examples in parallel while we are say learning the constructs and for that uh, i'm using the actually the only available tool uh, for uh, ontology building which is called protege which should be expected to start before the end of the day and um, Does it? I have two of them now, of course. Okay, you, you will learn better about this tool and the associated libraries from, on Friday, but just to, to get started, huh, we, we can make some examples. Um, this is an, a not, uh, a protege is an ontology editor. And, uh, from the Stanford University. It's a Java application. And it's uh, not intuitive at all. So you cannot learn what an ontology is uh, by looking at the interface and trying to play with that. Because if you don't understand what you are doing, you, you're really, I guarantee that you, don't, you won't find it. Hmm? So, um, you, you first first need to know what you want to do and then uh, it will be after that it will be easy to find it uh, in, in protege okay uh, I, I create a new ontology maybe I can create an ontology called uh, university for example uh, with the URI okay I can change it as I want it doesn't mean to be published it's just a, a name in which we try to describe you know, the concept about uh, teachers, students, and so on. It's something very familiar, very simple. Mm -hmm. So this uh, uh, part of Protégé contains the ontology header. The main part is uh, the name of the ontology in the namespace. Mm -hmm. And we can add uh, some uh, annotations if we want. Uh, and these are the possible annotations. Mm -hmm. So the context is a simple ontology. about universities, organizations, organizations, uh, whatever. Okay. And we start uh, adding content to this ontology. So the first thing we could add are classes. Hmm? As we said before, class is a member of the meta class uh, class. Sorry for saying the class too many times in a row, but uh, in no other way. So every result that has another type of class is a class. And uh, in uh, Turtle, we just say Mary is a person. Sorry, it's an instance. Uh, where's the other example? Yeah. I, I switched the slide, sorry. Um, human is a class canine is a class so these two are classes while daisy which is type canine is an individual okay we will defer individuals for a while first uh, think about classes so if we want to describe 
some university word, uh, we can go to this second tab entities and under the entities we have the different uh, type of elements that can be contained in the ontology classes properties both object properties and data properties add annotations if we want uh, data types and finally individuals so for now we know about classes and about individuals so uh, how we can we define a class here in Protege? Uh, actually, all classes in AWS are part of one very big hierarchy of classes and subclasses. There are two predefined classes, which, is, which are called OWL thing and OWL nothing. Thing and nothing. OWL thing is the most general class. It's a class, but we will, will always be a super class of my own classes. So I, I can create my own classes and then create subclasses of those. And we already know how to do that from RPS. Yeah. But in OWL, we know that every class we find is a subclass of thing. So create a new class. One easy way of creating a new, a new class and the way which Protege forces us to think is to create a subclass of thing. So there is no new class button anywhere, but if you go to thing, which is a predefined class, you can add a subclass here with this button here. So there's no new class. But there are subclass of thing. Every class should be a subclass of thing. And so we can create a new class by just creating a subclass of thing. Uh, for example, in a university, we have the university class or the let's say yes, university. University is a thing. Uh, we, the university may have uh, degrees, degree in informatics, electronics, and so on. So we can create another subclass of degrees. No, that was the question I was going to ask you. Uh, degree is, is degree a subclass of university? No. Is a degree a university? Is a special type of university? No, it's a part of the university. It's a, a, a resource inside the university. Okay? So it's not a subset of universities. Each university has their identity. And uh, so, for example, the university can be Polytechnic in Torino, and the degree would be Computer Engineering in Polytechnic in Torino. Hmm? There are different types of objects. If we want to create individuals, okay, for, for, for example, describing university, the, our university, we can create it, for example, on the instances, add new instance from the class. And uh, we, here we have the list of the full instances. We create a new one and we call it Politecnico Torino. And it would be a one instance of university. A degree, right now is the class of all possible degrees. We can state, axiom, that one degree is uh, uh, computer engineering. Hmm? So I have two classes each with one element. I'm not able yet to say with this computer engineering is a polytechnic or is another university. Huh? Right now we only have classes and, uh, um, and uh, instances separated. By the way, this polytechnic Torino is not the name of the university, right? It's the identifier. 
If we want to, have to say what is the name, we should have that data type property where we say that universities have names. And we provide the name for that. Right? We'll, we'll come to that in a second. This is, but this is not just this name. We, we could be we could we could call it U one two three four University one two three four. It's the same. Okay. It's uh, don't extract any meaning from the names that you see here, except except from the literals. But for now we don't have any literal yet. Hmm? Uh, there's also a faster way of creating a bunch of classes here uh, is add subclasses which brings you a window when you can write the, all the classes together and it will create all the classes in a, in a, in a bunch. For example, uh, we can have uh, in, into the degree via course. So degree in computer engineering, we'll have the course of analysis, uh, physics, uh, uh, computer science, and so on, which is which not, a, again, a subclass, it's a part. We can have uh, teachers and students that usually there are all people. And we can indent this so that uh, Protege will create uh, subclasses for us. And uh, it also asks us a, a question. It asks us, are we creating these classes, are disjoint classes? So in general, it's allowed for an instance to be instance of many different classes. Do we want uh, to forbid this? Do we want to forbid that an instance could be part of different classes when these classes are sibling to each other? So in our cases, go back, course and people first. Uh, can any instance be at the same time a course and the people? No. Maybe person is easier because it's singular. And uh, may a teacher, a uh, given person, could be a teacher and a student at the same time? Yes. You are PhD students, you can also be teachers. So actually, we, we cannot ask this for all of this. Huh? We, we will only apply it to a subset later. <coughs> okay. And this is the, the three of classes that we created so what we did was uh, creating classes creating instances and creating subclasses mm -hmm. uh, this is something that we already knew how to do in uh, RTL uh, subclassing is only one type of uh, class restrictions. The class restriction, we say that the restrictions are the main uh, way of giving meaning to the ontology, uh, say that uh, I create a new class, but this new, the element of this new class must respect uh, some additional constraints. For example, the element of a subclass must also be element of the superclass. So this is a constraint of, on what the subclass is able to do. Subclasses are the, the easiest one, the easiest type of, of restrictions. Mm -hmm. Also the less powerful ones, mm -hmm. less expressive ones. Uh, before we go further, uh, talking about the restrictions, uh, we, want, we need to define the concept of uh, expansion of a class. Expansion has nothing to do with, with restriction. Okay, restriction is a, a way of defining a new class or specializing a new class. The expansion of a class you know, is a separate concept. When we th think about the extension of a class, we are thinking about all the possible individuals that belong to the class. So if we call, uh, if, the, if the class for us is a set, then the extension of the class will are the elements of the set. Okay? Um, so, any individual may belong to the extension of different classes. It's not forbidden. Well, maybe these classes are related as subclasses of each other, so it's normal that the individual will belong to many of them. But those may also belong to separate uh, independent classes. It's not forbidden in OWL. And uh, one important thing, uh, difference uh, between, uh, say, classes as a set or classes 
they will not be complex. Is that if you have two sets that contain exactly the same elements, they are the same set. Even if you call them differently, uh, if you have uh, the set of all prime numbers uh, less than 10, or the set of all uh, odd numbers uh, except 5, or except uh, whatever, uh, 9, union with 2, two different expressions. You can create a set, you can create other sets. You discover that the elements inside are the same, so the sets are the same. In mathematics, you, you work uh, an equal sign. This set, computed in this way, is equal to that other set. In sets, and also in, in first order logic, uh, equality of the extensions means identity. In ontologies, no. Why? Because there are always elements that we don't know. So by noticing that two the extensions of two classes are equal, contain the same element, doesn't tell us doesn't tell us that the two classes are the same because maybe there is one element that we know we don't know yet about that is only part of, of one class and not of the other. Okay? So we cannot uh, compare classes by their extension, by their individuals. So the concept of the identity of classes should be proven at the logical level, at the conceptual level, and not at the assertion level. Not the individual level. Mm -hmm. This is something that the, um, two classes may contain the same elements, but not be the same class in any case. Okay. Um, so right now we are creating a tree of classes, putting individuals into those, and then and then we need to describe how these classes relate to each other or well, how the individuals belonging to the classes can relate to each other we do that by defining properties a property is a link an object property is a link between two individuals and we can constrain a property by specifying a domain and a range we can not we must in protege i can define a, i want to state that uh, for example uh, a university offers a degree okay so i can create a new property that links a university with a degree if you go here and say object properties again you have the same trick there is no new property, there, but there's a general top object property from which you can derive subclass your own. And you can create subclass of an object property that can be the university uh, gives uh, or offers degree. So this is a new property that they create. It's a new element of type, sorry, of, uh, of type property, of type object property. This is a subclass of top object property. If I want, I can restrict. Again, I'm adding information by restricting the, the, the object. Restrict this property by declaring the domain and the range of the property. If I don't declare domain to range, this property could be applied between any couple of elements, any pair of elements, of individuals. So I can say that uh, the domain of the relationship is of, uh, we have different ways uh, of creating a restriction, in this case a domain restriction. Uh, and uh, the, the easiest one is uh, the object restriction. So we only restrict this uh, um, property, this property, 
to have a university as the domain no sorry this is more complex than I need here the class per hour yeah university and the range is a degree so we are saying that offers degree is a property whose domain is a university and whose range is a degree links a university with a degree hmm. it's not something that we see here in the in the classes but you only see that in the properties except that we look at this usage uh, tab here when you say when you select a class you, you it collects uh, all the points in which that class is used and so it also picks up uh, the properties that you are defined that you have defined using that class so it's easy to uh, you or we must make a big effort of having everything in, in our mind because in Protege we only see a little stuff but we know what's happening uh, by the way before uh, we lose the file uh, if we want to save it we can choose in which syntax it needs to be saved usually we save that in XML uh, university but we, we may also save it in turtle university for example just to show what we did university let's see the title version this is what we did this is the our ontology that we just created some bunch of initial prefixes we have uh, the default prefix, so we don't say any prefix is our own uh, ontology. So the, the concept that we define with other prefix belong to our ontology. And this is an ontology. This is what, is sa what says that our, the URI that we chose is the URI that represents an ontology. And for this ontology, we have a comment. You see that this, we have a, a semicolon, so the subject of this comment is always this ontology URI. And then we go on, we define classes, this course, sorry, this is, the, this is just a comment. Course is a class, degree is a class, person is a class, and so on. Student is a class, and student is a subclass of person. Teacher is a class, and teacher is a subclass of person, and so on. Then we have properties. Offer degree is an object property. We define a new resource, we call it offer degree, and we say it's a type of pro object property. And since it's an object property, it's automatically a subclass of a top object property. So in Protege, we see it differently. We see we have to subclass the top property, and here actually it's a type declaration. It's the same. It's semantically equivalent. And this um, property has a domain and there's a range. And the domain and the range are these classes. In this case, they are simple classes. We have a simple restrictions over the over these properties. And at the end, we have the individuals. Computer engineering is a degree. It's also an individual, this is an internal name of OWL. Politecnico Torino is a university. 
So degree, university are classes. In protege, we we are not uh, we are okay, we are forced to follow the separation between the classes and the instances. So we, we cannot mix uh, and make uh, mistakes. Um, so actually, object properties, as we said, are just properties that links uh, link to other uh, two or different objects. Why data type properties are properties that link uh, an individual with an, a number, a literal, maybe a number, maybe a string, and so on. Hmm? So they uh, they give values. For defining these properties, uh, we create a new name of data type property or object property, and then we can apply this property between individuals. That's something that we didn't do, and of course, we, if we want, we can restrict the domain and the range of such properties. Um, this is what we did. What we didn't do yet, is to say that uh, computer engineering is a degree offered by Politecnico di Torino. Uh, actually, we have this property that says that in general, a university offers a degree, in general, but we need to say <coughs> that at the instance level, that Politecnico di Torino offers this specific degree. And we do that here with the assertions at the instance level. So right now we declare that there exists an object property. We have this individual where we assert that here we have uh, some, it doesn't show the list of the property, but you just control space and give the completion, okay? Politecnico Torino offers degree of computer engineering. And so we now add this additional triple to our uh, ontology. So by navigating ontology, we say that Politecnico Torino offer the degree computer engineering which is by the way a degree we don't see that computer engineering is offered by Politecnico Torino we, we didn't model it if we want to see it we should model the additional property we can do that of course we need another property another object property which is here which could be offered offered by And this property would have as a domain the degree and as the range the university. This doesn't make it uh, doesn't propagate to the assertions yet. We just know that we can create, at this point, we, co we could also say that uh, computer engineering is offered by Politecnico di Torino. Hmm? But in this way, we have to assert twice the same information. Uh, There's a shorthand for that. This shorten is to say that, uh, where is the object properties? That uh, offers degree, the property, and uh, offered by are the inverse of each other. So, in offer degree, we can declare that it's an inverse of uh, offered by. And of course, uh, Offered by is the inference of the of, of degree. It's an automatic step. The domain and the range can be left. You can leave them empty, and uh, the reason I could fill them if. Uh, but 
but you see that I would expect uh, that at this point I, I define the two as the inference of each other I go to computer engineering I don't see yet uh, Polytechnic of course here we are asserting facts, defining rules and explaining facts. The fact that uh, computer engineering is offered by Polytechnic Torino is uh, a logical consequence of what we modeled here. Because why? Because uh, um, what is that? Uh, offer by is an inverse property of uh, uh, offer course, offer de uh, degree. And uh, Polytechnic Torino offers the degree this computer engineering. So by putting together all this information, obviously uh, computer engineering would be offered by Polytechnic Torino. But for doing that, we need to interpret the logical meaning of what we did. Right now we just wrote, we just edited an ontology. We need a reasoner. To be able to infer this fact, to prove that this fact is true, to generate new assertions that are true, it is already true that computer engineering is offered by Polytechnic Torino. It is not known yet. That's the difference between true and known. It's true, but we don't know it. It's not asserted in the in the knowledge. So when we uh, we learn about the reasoning, we'll see that there's a difference between asserted information here and inferred information. That includes everything that we assert plus all the other information that the reasoning was able to add by applying the semantics of, of other hmm? So we state some information and we know that some other information will be automatically Infer. Right now, if I have a look at the turtle, I have this offer. Uh, Polytechnic Torino is a university and offers degree computer engineering. So we just added this line here on the RDF. And uh, um, these are just the, you know, the basic, uh, the basic uh, statements. We can create uh, sub-properties like we can create subclasses, which this was already from RDF. For example, we have a property name, which uh, every animal has a name, but maybe we have a register name, so no, the official name that will go to the, to the, uh, uh, to the city offices to register the name. Of our of our pet of our animals, and so this name is a type of name. It's a sub property. It means that uh, every registered name is also a name, but there may be names that are not registered. This means that this property name can have multiple values. A single dog can have multiple values, for example, Man multiple names. And of course, since the pro uh, properties can be organized into a hierarchy, a property, a property, a property. Uh, we also have here a top and bottom that correspond to the thing and nothing properties, and top and bottom data properties from the object and data properties separately. Hmm? Yeah, just just uh, wh where you find them. Uh, how you, you define them, you subclass the top properties. We saw the inverse property. Well, we, de we can declare that one. Uh, relationship is the, infer in the inverse property of another one. You don't need to, to say it twice because it's, uh, of course, uh, symmetrical. We could also, you know, uh, again, we, when we want to say something more, we apply some restriction, general rule. So if we want to say that two, um, relation, two properties are disjoint. Uh, there is this uh, property disjoint with them. Let's say that, uh, for example, if I have a mother relationship and a father relationship, I want to say that the mother and the father are different. And 
so we can say that the relationship with the, a mother, the relationship with the father from the same subject should lead to a different object. To a different uh, individual, target individual. So we can we restrict the way in which, uh, for example, father can have instances, can link instances. Actually, we are limiting how these two mother and father relationship may work, but by limiting them, we are stating a fact, stating a rule, not a fact at the A level, but a rule at the T level that mothers and fathers are different. They are both related to the child, but they cannot be the same. Hmm? So we model a rule, the knowledge that we have about the world, into a form of a restriction of how the properties can work. And of course, we want to, there are different syntaxes to, to say the same thing. So uh, you can say with a property joint uh, or all the joint properties, different ways, uh, but there are different cases. Hmm? Um, we can also, about properties, describe additional constraints about the property. For example, we can say the property is uh, symmetric. For example, knowing A of B means the property of B of A. Uh, the friendship in uh, I was called uh, Facebook is symmetric. Can be friend of somebody who doesn't accept you as friend of us. Asymmetric property is the converse. If uh, you sort, you are sorting people by age, by alphabetical order, or whatever. So if A comes before B, then it's not possible that at the same time B will come before A. So, uh, just to get some feel by the names, so, a yeah, property can be symmetric, can be asymmetric, or can be neither of the two. <coughs> of course. Um, asymmetric is not the opposite of symmetric. Reflexive property means that uh, every element is in relationship with itself, with itself. like equality, A is equal to A, is less skewed. Or either flexive is more useful, is that uh, it's not possible for you to be friend to be friend of yourself. Okay, so friendship in, uh, in Facebook is a property which is symmetric and irreflexive. So again, you are for forbidding ways in which you can create statements, and at the same time you are specializing this property, this object property. So it will behave like you want it to behave in that specific domain. Connectivity, a connective property, when A in relationship, in relationship, uh, is, uh, in relationship with B and B in relationship with C, then it follows that A is also in relationship with, with uh, C and so on. These are the main characteristics of properties that we can add. If, if we want to say, Mm, not not with these properties, but uh, how to say that? How to apply this? We, you see here, you have the, all the characteristics that you can apply to this uh, uh, to each of these uh, properties. In this case, uh, these two are non. I don't have any of these uh, particular. They are not transitive. No. No symmetric, no symmetric, no. Uh, most of this only makes sense uh, when the subject and the range are the same, or the domain and the range are the same. In other cases, uh, uh, the last two are interesting. A functional property means that. Um, The value of the property is unique. This is a mistake in the book, should be A, yes, A and A. Um, so, for example, if 
a property. The person has many. You can have many declarations because it's, uh, for the open assumption, Fulvio age 28. Fulvio age 40. Fulvio age 49 or whatever. You may have more than one. It's always possible. Uh, if the age is a functional property, it means that all the declarations of this, pro of this property should lead to the same value. In this case, A is a function. From a given individual, it only gives you the same result, not more than one result. So you, know, you, you may have many, but actually they all, they all say the same thing. You may only have one name. You may only have one age. Or inverse functional property is the reverse. If you know the value of the property, then you also know the owner of the property. Like the, when we do mathematics, we call them injectivity of the property. So when you know the results, when you know the value of the y-axis, then you can find a unique value on the x-axis. Uh, in this case, for example, in our uh, ontology offered by is a functional property because a given degree is only offered by university because uh, computer engineering at Politecnico Milano is a different degree they have different courses they have different teachers and so on so this is a functional property And offers degree is an inverse function of property for the same reason. Because if I offer a degree, if I know what degree is offered, then I also know, can know, the university. Because there's only university that can offer that. So if I know the target of the property, then the subject is implied, is unique. Not symmetric because uh, for being symmetric means that uh, uh, if A offers degree B, then B offers degree A. Okay, but no, it's not the same because we have an inverse. Uh, another way of saying that a symmetric relationship is when the relationship is the same as its own inverse. So if the relationship and the inverse coincide, then it's symmetric. In this case, we have a property and an inverse property which are different, because they have different domains and ranges. And so we are bit by bit specializing what we, what we want uh, these uh, properties to do. OK, these are, here, are, here are some examples. Uh, this was about object properties. Similar thing you can do about data properties, data type properties, where you can declare the domain, of course, and okay, the range is a literal, but you can restrict the kind of literal to a given data type. So, for example, you can say that uh, a university, well, this is easy, as a name, the name of the university is a data property sorry data property so we can create a new data property only one for the moment has name and we can say that the range of this property now we cannot choose classes we can only choose data types the name is a string example and is a functional property because a, a university may only have one name by the way I don't want to put the domain of this has name property to specify the university because also degree has a name also a person has a name also a course has a name so it's better to leave the domain free this property may apply to different objects, different things, 
whenever we want them to have a name. Otherwise, I would be forced to create a as university name, as course name, as degree name, as person name, many different properties, which all, all mean the same thing. Create a lot of sub properties, each with their own domain. If we need to be more specific, we can create a sub property here and add new constraints in that. Otherwise, we can just use the sub property that we all, that we, that's already valid for everything. I don't specify and force any domain. Hmm? So it's always also trying to anticipate what we need later to decide at what kind, of, at what level of precision we should stop. And uh, what time is it? Probably it's time to stop. Yes. Okay, there are other restrictions that we can, we can apply again to uh, the data type properties, uh, the length of the value, and so on, mm -hmm. if we want to, to, do, to be uh, more precise. Uh, one la last point I wanted to show you. Uh, this one. Two, two different columns. Two, two, two the first one is this. Um, enforcing a relationship um, with quantifiers. You know, uh, in mathematics, we know that there exists at least one or for all. Huh? Existence for all. We are used to, do, to describe those. So we can use them also to create uh, uh, new classes. For example, we can say, sorry, there may be many universities that are dead, for example. They don't offer degrees anymore, for example. No? Because we have maybe the history of all the universities, I'm just trying to make an example that fits with the, the property that we define up to now. So we, we may want to, to identify those. So we can try to identify the active universities. What's an active university? Of course, it's a university that offers at least one degree. So it's a subset of the universities we restrict the universities to, we create an object restriction in this case, saying that uh, the subject is university offers a degree, at least one, offers some degree. There is at least one degree that is offered by the, this university. Okay, so what it says that active universities are universities that offers some degree. This is a way of declaring a class without stating the action, without stating the fact. The reasoner will be able to infer which individuals we come to this class because there will be all the individuals that uh, satisfy all these conditions. And so there is uh, uh, some values from means that there's less than to one. All values from it means that there cannot be any value which is different from this. So it's only a subset, the whole subset of properties, or as a specific value. And I can constrain by these ways, or also by which is the same. Uh, concept by cardinality mm -hmm. minimum cardinality and uh, oh, one is the same as uh, at least at least one that's uh, the same as the sum of property we can also have maximum cardinality and so on mm -hmm. or a specific precise value for the cardinality the number of uh, courses offered number of degrees offered minimum the maximum and so on so in this case we can create classes by 
analyzing the properties in which they belong, in which they participate. This is how we are adding uh, new restrictions to the, to the classes. So basically, for completing this, uh, the main classes are already there. What we need to what we need do need to complete is adding new properties and adding new constraints, both to the properties restrictions, both to the properties and to the classes, to make it let's say uh, representative of the real behavior of this world that, of this domain that we are modeling. Okay, so I'm stopping now. We can have a break and then I will publish we can do the exercise of Spark QL. Uh, so that uh, you can have some fun to uh, just listen at me. Okay, we can have a 10 minute break.